Hello, all you freedom-loving people. Welcome to another episode of Front Page. I'm your host, Scott Cameron Goulet. Six hostages were brutally murdered by Hamas. The incident aroused public indignation. Their anger turned into pressure on the Israeli and U.S. governments. The conflict between Elon Musk and the Brazilian government has escalated. And the conflict between the government and the opposition in Venezuela has also escalated. The American people, regardless of their political leanings, are united in their view of the role that the United States should play in international affairs. Governor Cox of Utah, who has always disagreed with President Trump, recently changed his tune. He endorsed President Trump, but he does not plan to join President Trump's cabinet. His change of mind is puzzling to many. Okay, let's get into it. On Tuesday, Linda's son, a former deputy chief of staff to New York Governor Kathy Hochul, was charged with acting on behalf of the Chinese Communist Party, the CCP. The FBI arrested Sun and her husband at their home on Long Island. Sun was also charged with visa fraud, alien smuggling, and conspiracy to commit money laundering. Her husband, Hu, was also charged with conspiracy to commit money laundering, bank fraud, and misuse of identification means. Brion Peace, the U.S. attorney for the Eastern District of New York, said, as alleged, while appearing to serve the people of New York as deputy chief of staff within the New York State Executive Chamber, the defendant and her husband actually worked to further the interests of the Chinese government and the CCP. The illicit scheme enriched the defendant's family to the tune of millions of dollars. Our office will act decisively to prosecute those who serve as undisclosed agents of a foreign government. Prosecutors allege that Sun benefited significantly from Beijing's representatives. These benefits included the facilitation of several millions of dollars of transactions for her husband's business in China. According to an unsealed indictment, Sun allegedly act as an undisclosed agent of the CCP while holding high-ranking positions under Cuomo and Hochul. Sun is accused of having engaged in numerous political activities in the interest of the PRC, the People's Republic of China, and the CCP. Some of the activities include blocking representatives of the Taiwanese government from having access to the New York governor's office, changing the politicians' messaging regarding issues of importance to China and the CCP, obtaining the governor's official proclamation for Beijing's representatives without proper authorization, attempting to facilitate a trip to China for a particular politician, and arranging meetings for visiting delegations from the Chinese regime with New York state government officials. She was also accused of providing unauthorized invitation letters from the office of the New York governor. Those un unauthorized invitation letters allegedly constituted false statements made in connection with immigration documents. This was allowing Chinese officials to enter the United States illegally and to meet with U.S. government officials. Sun worked in the state government for almost 15 years. She held positions in then-Governor Andrew Cuomo, and she eventually became Hochul's deputy chief of staff. In November of 2022, Sun joined the New York Department of Labor as deputy commissioner for strategic business development. She left that job months later in March of 2023. Massive protests have erupted in Israel to rescue all Israeli hostages who are still being held by Hamas in Gaza. This is the largest protest since October 7, 2023. This is a response to the latest discovery of hostages being killed. The Israeli military said on Sunday that it recovered the remains of six hostages who were killed in a tunnel in Rafah in southern Gaza. This included an American. They were among the hostages who were taken by Hamas militants on October 7th last year. Their bodies have been repatriated to Israel. A spokesperson for the Israeli Ministry of Health said that forensic examinations had determined that the six Israeli hostages had been killed by Hamas who shot them multiple times at close range between 48 and 72 hours earlier. This means that they were killed shortly before Israeli troops arrived at the tunnel where they were. According to Israeli media reports, up to 500,000 people participated in the protests in Jerusalem, Tel Aviv and other cities. They are demanding that Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu do more to secure the release of the remaining 101 hostages who are being held in the Gaza Strip. 
protesters blocked the highways for several hours and clashed with Israeli police. According to aerial footage, Tel Aviv's main highway was packed with protesters carrying Israeli flags, photos of the hostages, and yellow ribbons in a tribute to them, as well as signs apologizing to the six hostages. Demonstrators demanded that Netanyahu reach a ceasefire with Hamas as a means of securing the release of the remaining hostages. They chanted, now, now. Israeli television footage showed police firing water cannons at demonstrators who were blocking roads. The local media reported 29 arrests. Israeli Defense Minister Yoav Gallant, who has often disagreed with Netanyahu, also called for a Gaza ceasefire agreement. Israeli opposition leader and former Prime Minister Yair Lapid urged people to participate in the demonstrations in Tel Aviv. Netanyahu said on X that Israel would not rest until it caught those responsible. He said, whoever murders hostages does not want a deal. We will hunt and get him. Netanyahu also claimed that the Israeli government was committed to a ceasefire agreement and he blamed Hamas for the failure to reach a deal. The new hostage killings have sparked public outrage in Israel. On Sunday, Arnon Bar David, the chairman of Israel's largest labor union, called for a one-day general strike on Monday. This call was supported by entrepreneurs from Israel's major manufacturers and high-tech industries in an effort to stop the strikes. Israel's finance minister wrote a letter to the attorney general. He was asking her to file an urgent petition with the Israeli labor court seeking an injunction against the strike. On Sunday evening, the state attorney's office and with the consent of Prime Minister Netanyahu filed an injunction request to the labor court to end the strike. A similar injunction request was filed by the Gavora Forum, which represents family members of fallen soldiers. The court quickly ruled that since the strike was in the nature of a protest and had nothing to do with workers' rights, it needed to be coordinated in advance and last for a limited number of hours since the strike was announced less than 12 hours prior to its start and it was not limited, it was therefore illegal, the court ruled. Following the ruling, Bar David, the chairman of the labor union, announced the strike was over and workers were ordered to return to work at 2.30 p.m. The latest hostage tragedy has not only put the Netanyahu government under pressure, but the Biden government has also come under fire. The bodies of six hostages were found in Rafah, which is the city that the world worked so hard to prevent Israel from entering. President Biden's opposition kept Israel out for three months. Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris withheld weapons to stop Israel from fighting in Rafah, and Egypt threatened to abrogate its peace treaty with Israel for a Rafah invasion. Following the reports of the slain hostages, former Democrat and billionaire Bill Ackman released a long statement blaming the Biden administration for failing America and for failing the hostage families. He believes that the responsibility for the human tragedy lies with the weakness of the Biden government. He wrote, Consider that the U.S. strategy over the last 330 days has been to pressure Israel to achieve a ceasefire in Gaza, including through the withholding of weapons from Israel and by periodically leaking our failure to support our ally to the media in the midst of hostage negotiations. It has been proven time and time again that the only thing that terrorists understand is brute force. Rather than pressure Israel, the United States should have put more pressure on our other allies in the region to help and do everything we can to help Israel defeat Hamas and recover the hostages. Twitter CEO Linda Yaccarino agreed with Bill's assessment. She wrote on X, perfectly said, further debate unnecessary. Bill Ackman also criticized Brazil for shutting down the X platform. Brazil's Supreme Court Justice Alexander de Moraes ordered a shutdown of X after accusing X of failing to appoint a legal representative in Brazil by a certain deadline that he had set. The blocking of X in Brazil has left 20 million users frustrated and it has also generated widespread condemnation from all sectors where free speech is cherished. Ackman said in a post on X on Saturday night, the illegal shutdown of X and account freeze at Starlink put Brazil on a rapid path to becoming an uninvestable market. China committed similar acts leading to capital flight and a collapse in valuation. The same will happen in Brazil unless they quickly retreat from these illegal acts. 
But there are also American politicians who support the decision of the Brazilian Supreme Court. Keith Ellison, the Attorney General for Minnesota, wrote on Monday in response to the ban, Obrigado Brazil, thanks Brazil, Musk claimed on X that Brazil had also frozen the assets of his satellite internet company Starlink because Starlink had openly defied a Brazilian court order to block access to X in Brazil. Satellite internet services have grown rapidly since their launch in Brazil in 2022, especially in rural areas and the Amazon forest where traditional internet infrastructure is limited. On Monday morning, U.S. federal authorities in South Florida seized an airplane that was frequently used by Venezuelan President Nicolas Maduro. The plane is known as Venezuela's Air Force One, and Maduro has flown on it many times on state visits. The seizure of the aircraft was a law enforcement action in response to the sanctions imposed by the United States on his government. Previously, the U.S. had determined that the purchase of the aircraft violated U.S. Executive Order 13884 signed by President Trump in 2019. U.S. Attorney General Merrick Garland said in a statement, This morning, the Justice Department seized an aircraft we allege was illegally purchased for $13 million through a shell company and smuggled out of the United States for use by Nicolas Maduro and his cronies. One of the U.S. officials said that the U.S. move sends a message to Venezuela at the highest levels. Matthew Axelrod, the Assistant Secretary for Export Enforcement of the Department of Commerce, said, Let this seizure send a clear message. Aircraft illegally acquired from the United States for the benefit of sanctioned Venezuelan officials cannot just fly off into the sunset. This incident marks the escalation of the ongoing U.S. investigation into corruption in the Venezuelan government. The U.S. recently pressured the Venezuelan government to immediately release specific information about the presidential election. They cited concerns about the credibility of Maduro's victory. Venezuela's attorney general issued an arrest warrant on Monday for the opposition leader Edmundo Gonzalez on charges of usurping government functions, forgery of public documents, incitement to disobey the law, conspiracy, and unlawful assembly. This represents a major escalation in the Maduro government's crackdown on the opposition in the wake of the disputed election. The United States has drawn up a list of about 60 Venezuelan government officials and family members who are expected to be subject to U.S. sanctions. Democratic presidential candidate Kamala Harris and Republican rival Donald Trump are actively campaigning to gain more voters. A poll shows that Democratic and Republican voters disagree sharply on many issues, including gun ownership and gender identity. Democrats believe gun violence is the worst problem, with 81% of Democrats surveyed holding that view. Climate change was the next choice for 75% of Democrats, and poverty and homelessness were important to 70%. For Republicans, on the other hand, inflation was the top issue at 89%. Illegal immigration came in second at 86%, followed by debt and drug abuse, both at 66%. But consensus does exist in at least three areas. First, on the issue of religion and national politics, more than half of the supporters of both parties believe that religion should be kept separate from government politics. Specifically, 87% of Harris supporters and 55% of President Trump supporters agree. Second, Social security is another area where basic consensus exists among supporters of both parties. The plurality of supporters of both VP Harris and President Trump believe that social security should not be cut in any way. Specifically, 83% of Harris supporters and 77% of Trump supporters support this view. The stance of these two candidates on this issue are basically the same now. President Trump's campaign website has always said that he will fight for and protect Social Security and Medicare from any cuts, including not changing the retirement age. So Harris has also now said on X that the Biden administration would protect and strengthen Social Security and Medicare. And a bipartisan majority of voters are in general agreement on the role of the United States as a global military superpower. Among respondents, 76% of President Trump supporters and 55% of Harris supporters agree that 
U.S. policy should strive to maintain America's role as the world's unique military superpower. In addition, another poll shows that inflation is the most serious problem that most Americans perceive. A whopping two-thirds of Americans consider inflation to be a very serious problem. Tied for second place are homelessness and debt issues, with six out of ten Americans rating these two topics as very serious problems. The poll also showed that the percentage of Americans who think that anti-Semitism is a very serious problem has increased in 2024 compared to 2022 and 2023. Well, more than one in five thought it was a serious problem in 2022 and 2023, that percentage has risen to nearly two-thirds of the public thinking that anti-Semitism is very serious in 2024. A few months ago, Utah Governor Spencer Cox was one of the few prominent Republicans who kept his distance from President Trump. But now Cox has changed his mind and he is backing President Trump. Cox did not vote for President Trump in 2016 or 2020. In July of this year, he explicitly told CNN that he would not be voting for President Trump this year either. However, a few days later, on July 13th, after the assassination attempt of President Trump at the rally in Pennsylvania, Cox then suddenly changed his mind. Cox wrote a letter to President Trump explaining that President Trump's righteous response at the time of the shooting prompted him to suddenly reevaluate and change his mind. Cox wrote, you probably don't like me much, but I want you to know that I pledge my support. Cox's reversal has puzzled political observers. After all, Cox has spent the past decade methodically projecting the image of a Republican moderate in the mold of Mitt Romney, the Utah senator who secured the GOP's presidential nomination in 2012. Cox, who is up for re-election and who is expected to run far ahead of his rivals, has suddenly embraced President Trump in a way that baffles some of the moderates in Utah that he has worked so hard to win over. It is well known that in some states, an alliance with President Trump can raise the political profile of some Republicans, but President Trump has little influence in Utah. Utah is one of the rare Republican states that has wavered in its support for President Trump. Of Utah's 3.4 million residents, about half belong to the Mormon Church, as it's widely known. Others are members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. In his letter, Cox said that he believes that President Trump can save the country by emphasizing unity over hate. Cox, who is a Latter-day Saint, said that he believes that God had a hand in saving President Trump's life. He even called it a miracle. Cox said in his letter to President Trump that he was not looking for a cabinet position or a role on the team. Rather, Cox told The Atlantic that he had come to realize that he could not have broader influence within the party if he was not on President Trump's side. On Tuesday, podcaster Lex Friedman published his interview with President Trump. They touched on several topics, including President Trump's upcoming debate with Kamala Harris, the Ukraine war, China, and more. Toward the end of the interview, Friedman brought up Jeffrey Epstein. He asked President Trump if he'd be willing to release all of the files related to Epstein's list of clients. And it seems that President Trump might expose all politicians, celebrities, and other powerful individuals who visited Epstein's island. But a lot of big people went to that island. But fortunately, I was not one of them. It's just very strange for a lot of people that uh, the list of clients that went to the island has not been made public. Yeah, it's, it's very interesting, isn't it? Probably will be, by the way. So if you're able to, you'll be... Yeah, certainly take a look at it. Now, Kennedy's interesting because it's so many years ago. You know, they do that for danger too because, you know, it endangers certain people, et cetera, et cetera. So Kennedy uh, is very different from the Epstein thing. But yeah, I'd be inclined to do the Epstein. I'd have no problem with it. And that's a wrap for this episode. Thank you so much for your support of Front Page. 
Please remember that every like, comment, and share helps more people to see the truth. If you haven't already, please subscribe. And if you have already subscribed, we thank you. But please double check to make sure that you're still subscribed because some of our audience have reported that they're somehow unsubscribed without their knowledge. We've also heard that many of you don't get notifications of our videos anymore on YouTube. So when you do subscribe on YouTube, please make sure to tap the notification bell as well. Okay, this is our show for today. Thank you so much for tuning in. If you like what you heard today, please don't forget to like this video and share it with your friends and family because everybody deserves to know the truth.